Welcome to those of you watching on YouTube. This is Blowing Smoke with Twisted Rico. I'm your host, Steve Ricardo. If you want to hear this entire show with intros, outros, and music, please go to Spotify, Apple, iHeartRadio, Amazon Music, etc. Please welcome to the show, Lindsay Troy and Julie Edwards of Deep Valley. Hello. Hey, how's it going? Hey. It's it's great to talk to you. Um, I, I didn't expect to be talking to you right before your farewell tour, which I just found that out in September. But before we talk about that, can we go back to the pre-Deep Valley days? I wanted to talk to you guys about when you grew up and stuff. I don't care who goes first, but I'm wondering when you started listening to music and when you realized it was something that you liked and you wanted to get involved in. Sure, yeah, I'll let Julie go first. Oh boy, hey, we'll do seniority. First. Okay, yeah, I'm older, so I'm gonna go first. Um, when did I start listening to music? I was always, I always loved classical music and um, musical theater. So that was my, that was how I got obsessed with music was through those genres. Um, like I just was like obsessed with Mozart's Requiem for so long as a little girl and like Les Miserables. So um, those two pieces of music are probably inside of everything I've created since then, somehow or other. Did you play any other instruments besides drums back then? Or did you start on No, I didn't instrument? start playing drums till I was 25. Like I didn't even, yeah, wow. I, I, that wasn't, yeah. I played piano um and then in in as a teenager I kind of got into a little like strummy acoustic guitar um my brother I have an older brother with amazing taste who's also an, an incredible artist he's in the band's failure and autolux and oh, uh, yeah but when I was like 10 or 11 he gave me dark side of the moon he gave me my bloody valentine loveless that's diverse <laughs> And now I'm not going to remember. There was like a third one. But anyway, those two, I knew that I was supposed to listen to them and, and get into them. Dark Side of the Moon scared me. Like as an 11 year old, I was like, this is a scary record. I'm scared of this. And I didn't want to I didn't listen to it again until I was like a teenager. And then, of course, you know, I got it. And And yeah, Loveless was like too loud and strange. I just didn't. But, th but that was the first little like, okay, he was inputting that, you know, here you go. And then um, like eventually those were part of like my top 10, you know, records of all time. Nice. And, yeah, I didn't, I didn't, I always like dated guys in bands and I was like a photographer and I'd shoot their shows and their band photos and like, you know, be in a big support position. And then it burnt out really heavily on that. <laughs> <laughs> and got really mad and decided I needed to be the band instead of, you know, be the band aid. And um, yeah, I started a band called the pity party with my, with my GBF, which stands for gay best friend, um, Mark Smolin. And it's, it was like a weird experimental, like confrontational kind of, non-listenable punk art punk thing you guys went to england right mm -hmm. yeah um yeah i was gonna bring that up um lindsay did you get an early start on music or were you listening to music i did a lot? um i did i'm gonna i'll give you the rundown and then i have to run and make a bottle because i hear my baby crying i'm sorry i <laughs> quick it's rundown okay. talking um, points go i was hoping he would just nap but i hear him crying so um okay well let's see here you should let him cry well I, the thing is i didn't give him his bottle before his nap which he was supposed to have he just passed out he was so tired and now i think he just woke up hungry so it was kind of a weird it was a weird thing this is great this i didn't is what accept mom rockers it. talk about man um, <laughs> basic parenting trips on my podcast i love it i know um but but anyways i'm just gonna let him cry for a minute tips, not trips tips although it's probably a um, <laughs> he'll survive he'll survive a couple minutes crying cry it out um okay so yes my life with music um so i grew up 
uh let's just put it this way my dad was like a massive was and is but like was more I guess a, a huge deadhead like big so that's like a big part of his identity um like he went to Woodstock and uh, when he was a teenager and um really shaped it shaped him big deadhead you know really liked being being in the scene you know being a hip cool guy in the scene so I grew up with a lot of that around like I did go to some Grateful Dead concerts when I was really little but I don't remember because and then Jerry Garcia died my dad wrote some books about Jerry Garcia but we kept like going to like my dad was still like living the dream like after Jerry died like we would still go to all the spinoffy like you know bands like all the Grateful Dead spinoff bands like so I grew up going to a lot of festivals like tons of music festivals wow. with my friends in a van we would road trip like every summer but probably more like once or twice a year we would be road tripping going on these really fun adventures going to festivals we would have like these musicians and bands stay at our house when I was growing up so I was around that um and um like the one woman I remember staying with us who was uh, like a blues singer. I thought she was really cool. So, um, but yeah, just around a lot of music. Um, I was not like, I was just grew up around the Grateful Dead, but like, I wasn't, I wasn't really a deadhead. I, mean, I am maybe more now, like I can appreciate it more, but it, to me, it was just more kind of the soundtrack of my youth. But the stuff that really spoke to me that I heard, like from my from my parents' CD collection was um, like the Beatles, like stuff like that, you know, like that was one of the early CDs I remember just like loving, like pulling Abbey Road CD from, um, from my parents' CD collection and listening to that a lot. Um, also like a Marvin Gaye best of record that I had, um, from there, maybe that was from their collection. Um, the doors, you know, like, so that kind of stuff was that, that bit, stuff that was a bit more like, yeah, less jammy, I guess. Um, uh, so yeah, like the doors, the Beatles, um, and then I, I started piano lessons from a really young age, like four, um, we have this really cool, I still have it, this beautiful upright piano from like the 1800s and in my nice. home. Um, and, and then, so I was always doing recitals and from a young age, I was, I wanted to, I don't know, like it was, it was cool. It was fun doing the piano recitals, but I wanted to, for whatever reason, I had this idea. Like I asked the teacher if I could do singing and playing at the recital so she was like, sure. Um, so I would do like the Disney songs, you know, and sing and play them. And, um, and you guys then, both grew up in LA, right? I meant to ask that too, with the, you both grew up in LA. I'm actually from San Diego, but I'm like, San you know, Diego. I'm, I'm a more or less a Valley girl, you know, but a San Diego Valley girl, I guess. And, uh, but the first, the first CD I wrote, like, or album I remember really like speaking to me as like a sort of modern thing that I heard on the radio I remember being uh in the car with my mom driving and the radio was on and I remember Alanis Morissette coming on when I was a little girl and like um what was it you ought to know you yeah know, that's okay. the one and I was just like what is this like I was hooked hook line and sinker I was like this is it baby like you know that was the first time I remember discovering like my own music on my own that I like loved me and all my best girlfriends when we were little we all had that cassette tape we were all obsessed with it. we knew every lyric on the record to Jagged Little Pill we had like a cover band called um the Alanis Morissette <laughs> and we were just like strum along on like the guitars and basses in my family and then like the one so my one friend Megan was like had to play on like Tupperware and apparently I, she told me this later that I was like being really rude to her because I was like you know you really have to buy a real drum set but I don't remember <laughs> saying that when we were little um so when did yeah. you move to LA I moved to LA uh when I was 18 18 so yeah, later on when I was like around 10 or 11 or 12 I picked up guitar I was a folky singer songwriter um sorry I just realized this is long-winded it's just a lot to cover many years but 
folky singer songwriter was in a band with my sister when we were teenagers had a lot of record deals throughout my life it's got a really young start the and, Troys, uh, right yeah yeah um, i heard about the Troys. kind of a weird experience because we were so young and they were really trying to like just sh like they were trying to make us into like avril lavigne clones it was just kind of a weird a weird thing you know but when you're young it's always a bit weird and and then anyways, um, in the end, that didn't really pan out, kind of maybe probably for the better. And then, yeah, I was just kind of moved to L.A., doing my thing, um, had a job, was playing shows as a singer songwriter and then was kind of bored with it. I didn't really love being a solo singer songwriter. I found it yeah, a bit boring. And then I met Julie and the rest is history. And I don't have to ask any questions because you're answering all my questions. I know. I Yeah, it was a lot. <laughs> Julie, did you grow up right in L.A., like the Valley or? Yeah, I grew up in the Valley. Um, I grew up in the Shallow Valley in Encino, Sherman Oaks. Oh, I used to yeah. work at, I worked at, uh, right on Ventura Boulevard at Metal Blade Records in like the early 90s. And I lived in Encino. Wow. Get I, out. Lived, I lived we there in Rubio. Then. I remember the street, Rubio. Yeah. Rubio. There yeah, a, Ventura Boulevard is so different now. I was just there last year. It's it's, it's like amazing so though. I forgot how long it was and how many stores there are on it. It's like non yeah. you could draw I drove all the way down to Topanga one one day when I was there because I love love doing that. Um so you you guys drives. I love those. Yeah, I don't do those anymore, but <laughs> you know, I haven't I haven't lived in LA since 2007, but every time I go there, I have to go down to Panga Canyon. I have yeah. to. Oh, it's we so actually cool. when we were on a when we were on a major label, we basically forced them to pay <laughs> to rent us a uh, a house in Topanga cuz they wanted us to write more hits. Island, right? Like Island? Yeah, oh, Island, yeah. UK. And so we were like, okay, but then the only way that we can do that is if you rent us a house in Topanga. So we had, we got this like beautiful A-frame with a hot tub, like in the trees in Topanga for, I don't know, Linz, how long were we there? Um, Was it, I don't know either. Was it a, was it a couple weeks or was it a month? I don't know. It's not like a lifetime. It probably wasn't that long. We're probably still recouping that right now. Um, I know, probably. right? Um, because we're like we're old school, you know. I just mm -hmm. in my mind, I'm just like, oh yeah, Sorry, you have chair. to rent us a house, you know. Like <clears throat> we're the Red Hot Chili Peppers. You have to. Yeah. Why not? You know, we wanted to live like we wanted to live the '90s major label dream, you know, and that seemed like that's part of that the nightmare that dream. dream. The nightmare it's, dream. it's funny because I worked at a major label in the nineties. I was at A and M Records during the whole nineties. Yeah, uh, I don't know what kind of a dream it was, but it turned into a bad one. <laughs> yeah, that's what happened. So, um, <laughs> we you mentioned the pity party, Julie, yes. and uh, I know that was your first band. Now you had just left that band had just split when you start. When you were running a knitting shop or something. Yeah, I had a knitting shop called The Little Knittery. Um, I had been working as a manager at another knitting shop, and I, I have no idea why I have an entrepreneurial spirit. It's really a curse. Girl boss. I'm really trying to suppress it all the time because it's like makes my life a profound misery. But um, Are you still I, knitting? I, I, I haven't knit in so long, um, but... Uh, but yeah, I, I, so I had a knitting shop all during pity party and I, I kept like not being able to afford rent and I kept having to move it and find like cheaper retail rent. Um, so I think I was in my third location when Lindsay wandered in with her stained t-shirt, no bra and messy hair, <laughs> which is, is how we met. Like literally everyone always thinks like, did you make that story up? And it's like, no, that's just literally what happened i think I, everyone knows that story that knows the band <laughs> seriously it's, it's true yeah. like cro they always say crochet they met at crochet class or something i think what's crochet I mean, well, the first it actually lesson? was a crochet class yeah yeah that's true mm -hmm. but then she came and took a knitting class 
And I, I had I had taught like hundreds of people how to knit and crochet. So I'd experienced a variety of sort of eye-hand coordination um, skills in different people. And like Lindsay was a really fast learner. You always say that. And I just like- you were, dude. My ass. No, you were. I mean, I have, I, there was a full range. There are people who won't like, won't learn because they're too scared. There's yeah. so much anxiety that it gets in the way of their body, like absorbing information. Well, it's probably because I'd been a guitar player and stuff my whole life. Cause it's like yeah. the dexterity. Did, did you know that she was a musician when she wandered into your store? No, when she wandered in, I was just like, here comes a really high maintenance customer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so being, if, Julie, like tell, tell him basically like owning a knitting store is like being a really like, like low, low earning therapist. Yeah. It's like being a captive slave therapist, basically, because you're just there and then people can just come in and like use up your time and then you teach them how to knit and people would just tell me I mean I would get all of like they would tell me things they'd never told anybody which is good because I don't have any memory and I don't care so whatever they told me like it, it literally as they were saying it it was falling out of my brain already <laughs> so it was fine I was a good repository for that kind of uh, oh no I hope they're not watching this now <laughs> they're like Sorry. that was one of their core memories you know um well, you know, wow. but so yeah, like when people like people would tell you what about just like their affairs or their divorces <laughs> or their mental illness or just yeah, their affairs, their childhood molestation, their whatever. I mean, they would tell me everything. Wow. People always tell me everything. I have a weird, I don't know what it is, but, but I will, but people you know what like, it is. It's because you actually listen. But I don't you know listen. It's just, it's just a face I make that looks like I'm listening. <laughs> just really thinking about something else. No, but you know what struck me about Julie when we met? Because I, you know, I'm not originally from LA. I moved to LA from San Diego. So it was a culture mm -hmm. shock. It was a real culture shock for me moving to LA. Because in San Diego, I was kind of big fish, small pond down there. And then I moved to LA and I just felt you know, just a lot of things, but so different, very different, but you know, a lot of real, um, I don't know, a lot of real, yeah, yeah, yeah. Everyone's trying to be someone up here. A lot of, um, narcissism, a lot of vapidness, you know, a lot of people talking at you, telling you how great they are and important and how, you know, whatever. Anyways, Julie struck me as different and maybe that's actually because she's native LA so she didn't have like the personality of these like narcissist imports or whatever that like came to LA to be a movie star so she was like yeah like I I maybe you weren't listening but I felt like you were actually listening and you would reply with really interesting intellectual introspective answers you were just different you were a lot more you were just different than the other people I'd met in LA when did you, know? you guys realize you were both musicians during that well, first that Therapy yeah. session. Yeah. In the first lesson, in the first, um, it was like the first, the first crochet class was only two people. It was Lindsay and it was a filmmaker named Saskia Jewel. Um, and sounds famous. Yeah. Saskia. She's right. Yeah. It's a great name. So, like, um, we were just talking, you know, it was just like a total rap session because once you get the basic, the basics of crocheting under your belt then you're just sitting and kind of doing it so then you know the 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 stitch and bitch as it's called can occur um and yeah so we were talking about being artists and the, the experience and Lindsay and I were both sort of at I, I think you would call it like a low ebb um mm -hmm. of this experience of being musicians pity party was really like we'd really lost the plot um and it you had were close to going back to school right and kind of just weren't you for psychology yeah of course well now if i go back it's more psychology specific, and it'll be forensic psychology that's what i would go back for now did I... <laughs> did you i mean 
but yeah, that conversation, we really bonded, you know, I really like, I really, we really bonded during that conversation. And, um, well, I love Lindsay's story because I'm really, um, so interested in childhood adversity, adverse childhood experiences. And I felt like Lindsay's story of being a musician and a pop star had happened pretty early failed, in her- failed pop star. Yeah, it had happened pretty early in her life. And to me, it like fell into that category. That's like one of my favorite sort of points of obsession, which is like shit that happens to us when we're young that, you know. Yeah, it really shaped me. And it really like, I I mean, I feel it really damaged me in a lot of ways. Um, But, you know, that's okay. We all have stuff that damages us, I guess. That's okay. We're fine. Uh, how did you how did you decide that you wanted to play together did she play some songs for you she gave me her her solo like ep was it an ep lens or yeah it was an ep yeah yeah and i i remember like closing the shop up and uh, she didn't give it to me that first day if we're really going into like specific detail i feel like she kept wandering in and like yeah. Visiting and whatever. So finally she gave me the CD and I remember was I a nanny at the time. I think I was a nanny at the time. Right. Or was maybe I was, this was post nanny. Actually, I think I was just a background performer at this time. Yeah. So I was just doing background on TV and film. Oh, you were like, yeah. So it was, that was my job. So it was very sporadic. So like I didn't extra have work. You mean extra work? Yeah. Yeah. A background artiste. Just kidding. Yes, yeah. Background artiste. <laughs> um, I remember could, closing. Uh, if you comb through the remake of 90210, uh, you'll see me a lot in the background at the high school walking. Lindsay, you gotta like make a sizzle reel of all your background. And we can <laughs> we could do it. It could be a music video. Come on. I know. Yeah. It's true. When, when, when they when they did the new 90210 recently, yeah. did you I had Christine Elise McCarthy on my show. I don't know if you ever met her. She she was on, she played the psychiatry. We're going to be Let talking about psychiatry the entire time. I think. Um, um, I I was always in the high school. Was she a high school student or no? No, no. She was like uh, she she met with the older cat, the old cast in a scene. Oh, she okay. was Emily yeah. Valentine in the original. Uh, oh, nine zero two one zero. She oh, was on my show recently. She grew up a punk rock girl in Boston. Yeah, dude. And she Emily hung out. Valentine. She hung out with all these um, hardcore bands, SSD Control and DYS and all them. And I I've had them on my show because there's been a real resurgence with hardcore. So I asked her to come on she was really cool i didn't expect to be Amazing. talking about this right now wow yeah, Emily yeah Mountain, i mean was she redhead she she i don't know what she was in the she, i wasn't really i didn't I watch feel like i'm picturing it i need to look it up <laughs> yeah, yeah it's interesting um oh you know yes. the film the film world is very much like a um like a cast system and you're really the lowest of the low as a background extra performer so it's um you really find out like which actors are like actually like good authentic people like the ones that will like say hello and like to actually talk to the extras and the background artists you're like oh you're like a good person you know you know, I found that out also. I, w- I was a bass player actually in a film once. So all I did was I was in the background oh, yeah. playing bass. But Sissy yeah. Spacek and William Peterson were the stars. They were really cool. I got to work on a, a few films because I did like, I was assistant to a music supervisor for a while. Mm-hmm. So I ended up in a movie. It was crazy. But you were like a featured extra. <laughs> I made a lot of money. That's a step above the lowest of the low. They Taft hard lead me. I don't know if you know what that means. So I ended up getting tag rate. So you had lines? No, but I got paid four hundred fifty dollars a no, day. Man. Craft crazy. Hartley is so that you don't have to join the union because you don't have to join SAG the first two or three times, whatever it is, and then after that they force you to join. It was an enormous oh, amount of money right, to do right. nothing, <laughs> and I didn't even play bass very well, you know. So I was just kind of like, acting, yeah, acting cool. all weird and shit. But I've got way off track. Sure, <laughs> that's what happens. So when did no, you? No, I know it's. You're, I'm really now. I'm having. I'm thinking about Julie's idea of the music video. Of- <laughs> It'd be so funny, or at least a little, little, little bit of content for the social medias. I know. I always like. I make my. Uh, once in a while, I'll make my fiance like suffer through. Well, not that's not the right word. I'll force him to watch something 
because I want to like see. <laughs> you want to well, find yourself? Wanna... Yeah, but actually the, the two movies I'm talking about are actually fantastic films. So that's, I never make him watch like the bad shows I was on. This, the two movies I, I made him watch, we watched recently that we, I saw myself in was um Greenberg, fantastic movie. It was a Noah Baumbach movie. Um, that was the movie that him and uh, Greta Gerwig, I think, fell in love. Oh, yeah. With. You know, that wow. power couple, they made Barbie and stuff. Yeah, you yeah. You know that power couple. <laughs> so that was, and and I met Ben Stiller and he was so cool and nice. So that was that yeah. one. And then um, <clears throat> the Tarantino, Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. Is oh, that I love that. I've watched it like five times already. I absolutely love that you gotta film. got to spot Lindsay. She's in yeah. there. <gasps> you gotta, Are yeah. Are you one of the like, Manson girls? <laughs> no, that would have been cool. I'm one of the, um, I was one of the like um flight attendants in the airport wow i gotta go back <laughs> and watch it and look for you i didn't know and, that you yeah were tarantino was calling so me and this girl we the, the wardrobe was so good on that movie um i love it like this is not about our band at all but <laughs> um it's yeah the wardrobe because it was all authentic like all the whole wardrobe for that movie was all authentic vintage stuff from like the 60s or 70s yeah six so late 60s cool. yeah so they had us um the flight attendants in like real like retro super cute they were like hot i think they were hot pink or hot orange those really cute vintage uh yeah flight attendant stewardess outfits I and everything had to be vintage even the bra like they had to be like the old school bra like everything so that it looked you know they didn't want like a modern underwire like it had to be truly authentic um yeah and tarantino was calling us the lollipop the lollipop ladies or the lollipop girls and i got chinese food at like five in the morning and at lax next to leonardo dicaprio and i was like using my peripheral vision to like you know check him out um see you know see what see how much chow mein he was putting on his plate i'm, I'm gonna look for your scene but i can't fast forward to honestly it. I'll have to it's watch so hard the whole film like, I, honestly i could barely i couldn't even find it this time but john was able to find it um so but yeah and anyways it's fine that's a funny idea julie you can tell she went to film school because she thinks of these types of ideas film school where, where did you go to film school i went to nyu wow oh, i spent and, you know, it's really, i'm so old so it's really funny to think about like literally we were editing we were chopping film strips and chopping like half inch oh, don't say mag, stuff like, like that. soundtrack She's not old <laughs> with tape no, we were cutting it with scissors and putting oh, it together with tape when we edited it. That's how they that's did like it. How old? Real I am. film, baby. The real stuff. That's right. Real film. It's like knitting when you do it that way because it's just all like strips and strands you're putting together. Yeah. Is it okay if I ask a couple questions about the band? <laughs> Not about at what? All. The band, yeah, of course. <laughs> when, did you, when did you start playing together? And did you have songs that you brought in, Lindsay, or did you did you guys write together? How did that all start? Okay, well, this brings me back to getting Lindsay's CD. She gave it to me, and I closed up the shop, and I got in my car, and I put the CD in, and I drove away from the shop. And all of that's very, like, um, vivid for me. Core memory. <laughs> core Deep Valley memory. Core, core memory. And I just... You know, although the music style wasn't like necessarily exactly my wheelhouse because I've discovered later in life that I think I'm a little bit on the autism spectrum and I'm very, that what that translates to is that I'm a snob about music, but really I have like intolerance for certain stuff and I'm only comfortable with certain stuff. And um, I put the it- The style in, probably wasn't like, cause it was, it was very like classic singer songwriter and it probably yeah, it wasn't was like- proggy enough for you or something it just or it like just i need mean, enough for you yeah like whatever my my weird you know problems are my my sensory overload problems or whatever but um yeah basically i just remember listening to it and just being like really like blown away by Lindsay's voice by her choices by like the muscularity of her voice, like the things it could do um, and by the lyrics. So like, there were so many things that I was like, damn dude, like why is someone floating around aimlessly who has this capacity? Like, how can this be? I just, I couldn't believe it. Um, 
And so then we made a plan to jam. So I, I had been in pity party, but somewhere in my mind, I always felt like I really wanted to try doing an all female thing that felt like something that was worth uh, trying. And um, yeah, so we we set up a time to jam and I had a really like dear friend of mine, Ashley Reeve, who was then called Ashley Zerigian. Um, and she is this smoking hot bass player. And I had known her from my friend's band, Great Northern, and she and I had been buddies for years. And so I was like, oh, well, Lindsay plays guitar. I should have Ashley come. And like, we have three different hair colors. So like, this will be perfect, man. It was all How very conceptual. Go? Like, cause so she was very bright red at the time I was blonde and Ashley was a brunette. So like, we got all the bases covered. <laughs> All the hair bases, you know, you need hair variety, man. Yeah, I've got the um, hair variety covered. <laughs> we got, you know, we got the rhythm section. We got, we got the, you know, the classic three piece. Yeah. So we got together and jammed and I feel like we were, were we jamming on, was it Baby I Call Hell? No, it was, um, um, it was that kind of stalkery song that was like, it was God's country. Remember it was do you want me do you like me do you something like that so you do had these songs of that? Yeah. um do we have iphone recordings of that Lindsay? i'm gonna make a note in my to-do maybe list. on that old iphone that i dropped in the toilet that mira plays with oh man <laughs> you you had these song. you had songs already Lindsay, that you said let's jam on these songs i think that yeah i was really nervous i was really nervous but really excited like i really like i knew in my heart i'm like this is it because i like i was just at that i was at that point where i was like ready honestly spiritually it sounds a little weird but i think like the knitting like is what made this happen is because I had felt, yeah, like I'd kind of plateaued in my life a little bit. Like as you become an adult, you're not in school. You're not like challenging, learning new things. I felt like I wanted to push myself out of my comfort zone and do something to like prove to myself that I could like still pick up a new, new skill as like, as an adult, like something totally out there and just like do it. And that, so I did that with the crochet and the knitting and just doing that. I feel like for whatever reason, whatever you want to call it, the universe or whatever was meant to be destiny. It was like, I needed that step to make this band happen or something. They give me like the courage and the, um, the self-confidence or something to do this band. So, um, yeah, I was very nervous. And so, it, cause especially we were going into like going to be an electric rock band or whatever. And I was coming out of the singer songwriter world so I, I took a couple guitar lessons uh, with a friend to to kind of prep for our for our band rehearsals, and then I got some ideas, like wrote a, a couple ideas, just some like riffs, a couple ideas at home, so I didn't come in completely empty. And then I think we jammed on those, so they so weren't you, like full, full fleshed out. I just a couple things to come in, you know, Jack White style, like you know, you come yeah. in with an idea, but you make it seem like you. I'm just joking. You make it seem like you came up with it on the spot. It's kind of like, uh -oh, let's I, not make jokes about Jack White in the press. Yeah. It's, it's so, so it's kind of a punk. I, I call it like a punkified. No, but I will sound. say, uh, I, I was, I, I was and am a huge Jack White fan. So I was, uh, which is obvious by your sound. So but, I, you know, cause he's, he's like them, you know, I grew up loving classic rock. So he, um, you know, he's kind of like the modern version of like that coolness, you know? So, I, yeah. I call I call the sound I this is just what I call like punkified blues. Did you come up hmm. with that sound like your the the way you play? It's just so dirty sounding. Did you have that right from the start? Because you said you were playing like you were a singer songwriter. How did you come up with that sound? Oh, sorry, I heard my baby crying. Um, I have to address that in a second. Um. How did I come up with wait with the Deep Valley sound? Yeah, your your guitar sound is really distinct. You know, it's very punkified, bluesy sound. And um, well, I just had a very limited, um, like pedal, a very limited pedals at the beginning. Like, 
you know, so Julie bought, like I had a couple pedals that I went to guitar center and bought, um, that I could afford or whatever. And then like Julie bought me a pedal for my birthday or Christmas or something. So I had like, yeah, like a boss octave pedal. I don't even know if I had, yeah, boss. At first I had the big muff pedal that may have been the only pedal. Then I had the boss octave pedal. And then Julie got me a delay pedal, like a really weird, like an off brand Delta labs. Um, and, um, but I yeah. think, but it might be cause so I had pity party was a two piece. So mm -hmm. I had my bandmate and I had spent years grappling with how you fill out the sound there. I'm sorry. I'll and, be right back. Okay. Yeah, sure. Yeah. So I, 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 you know, I'm sure Lindsay and Mark put their heads together because Mark had figured out some hacks for a two piece. So like, um, definitely like the octave, right? You need the octave -er. and, um, then splitting the signal. Cause it's like eventually Lindsay was, she splits her signal between a basement and like a, a twin reverb or a deluxe reverb so that she gets this like larger frequency range um from one instrument and that's what that's what mark did so we kind of it's like this this perfect you know evolution of myself coming from this two piece and having access to the resources and information regarding doing that and then like Lindsay's really like really well honed classic approach to songwriting and structure and melody and um yeah so so for the first jam which we did with Ashley it was it was super fun and we decided our band was called God's Country spelled C U N T R Y <laughs> That would have gone over really well. Yeah. <laughs> um <laughs> So yeah, I'd say punk blues is definitely like the attitude. So what I happened what happened to the brunette? She didn't She got she like got a job touring with Adam Lambert or something. She just basically got hired and just went on tour and has been on tour oh. since then. like she uh she lives in Vegas now so we're gonna see her in March when we go through Vegas which we're really excited about nice uh, um did you and, play any gigs like early on like did you start playing right away or did you record first because it seems like a lot happened from 2011 to 12. a lot happened really fast yeah a lot happened really fast um I'm probably our first gig was like silver lake lounge um and maybe our second gig was like hotel cafe maybe there's Did a you... really early video on youtube that's from hotel cafe really and that was the video that sort of started to attract uh industry to us um and then we were being sort of poached or not poached but courted by an a r at Universal Republic, talking to her a lot. Um, and she connected us with a manager, you know, because obviously a &R, they're like, you know, I'm not going to deal with a band who doesn't have a manager. So they want to people you with a team. And the manager was Deb Fenstermacher, who I happen to have known already for many years. So that was like amazing because it was like, you know, I think I think ha the the opportunities we had early as a band, everything moved fast and got really big, and um, that's a perfect storm. Like the way elements need to align, even for that kind of a beginning, it's almost like statistically impossible. You know, the way they need to continue to align to sustain and grow and like that's the hard part. These... <laughs> yeah. So all of that's a crazy perfect storm as well. You know, I think like as a band, in all honesty, I just don't think that continued to happen for us. But in the beginning, that was happening. So you had you had those two sing singles, uh, gonna make my own money and uh end of the world. And then all of a sudden you're in the, you're in the UK. You got a UK deal. Did your manager help you with that, or how yeah, did that so, all come together? So basically, we were working with Deb, and Deb was uh, working with this manager, James Sandum, and James just kind of came in and like swept us away and was like, "I have a plan." So he really wanted to bring us over there. He was UK, ba he's UK based. And um, so he yeah. knew that you guys would hit it out there if you, if you, yeah, went. that was, that was like, 
that's what he wanted to do. So I, I remember we Great went over plan. there. We played this tiny showcase at this like 80 capacity venue in Brighton. I think maybe the haunt, but I, but I could be wrong. And um, basically he said he did never seen so many labels at one show. Like it was, it was 80 people from labels. So and then how did we, that buzz happen so quickly out there? Um, people just wanted it and knew other people wanted it, right? So, Because I'm always analyzing this kind of stuff, right? So like if, if one person knows someone else wants it, then the value of it increases. If those people know that a couple people want it, then the value of it increases, right? So I think like somehow word had gotten around the labels and and in UK's little it's like a little it's a little manageable size world right so like all these labels were at that thing and then Lindsay and I did the dog and pony show at so many labels in London so many like big from majors to tiny boutiques we like went and met everybody and uh and another little aspect of this of course is communion which is Ben Lovett from Mumford and Sons label yeah, we had gotten on his radar and he and communion actually signed us with Island UK. Mm -hmm. So Ben was and has been and is like a huge champion of ours, which is amazing. Um, so in between from when you started to like by the end of 2013, you, you'd already played Glastonbury and yeah. Bonnaroo. And it was the fast. Wedding I mean, it Festival. was just like fast. I never, it was, I remember hearing about you guys. And next thing you know, you're at Glastonbury. I'm like, how did that happen so fast? Yeah, it happened so fast. Um, like the album was barely out the day, you know, Sistronic was based barely out. You had the EPs and the singles, but then the album came out and wow. Yeah. Uh huh. It's funny because when Lindsay and I started, I was so disillusioned at that point and like heartbroken by kind of the way things went with the pity party. Um, and I said to myself, I'm like, you know what? I'm going to give this six months. Wow. Like I'm, I'm never like it worked over a music thing again. And then, yeah. So ironically, I was like, I'll give this six months. And then literally like it, everything, it, it, it happened. It happened within that weird arbitrarily imposed time Major label trajectory yeah so so tell me about stars baby I, i'm very i'm really curious about what it was like for you guys to play glastonbury i have to ask you this because i remember watching it and i was like holy shit i mean you guys weren't even were around for only a few years and here you are the biggest festival like i think in the world one of the biggest what was that like <laughs> It was incredible. I mean, it's dream, you know, but the truth is like, we were on this, we were so lucky. Like we were playing, so, we were just touring nonstop. I mean, I don't know if that's the lucky part, but the lucky part is that we were getting to play so many incredible festivals yeah. all over the world. Um, but I so think the reality of the experience is, you know, Glastonbury was a difficult load in because this our stage was like in the middle of the festival where there wasn't like you couldn't it, there wasn't vehicle access and then the festival's so huge and giant so and we didn't have a lot of time so we were so we were touring so much and we were doing so much press so in other words we would we'd hit the ground somewhere and we would do hours and hours of press around our play so i think like it's yeah. hard to isolate and it, when someone says, what was it like to play that or do that? It's hard to isolate it because of the sheer volume of work that we were doing, basically like 24 hours a day at that time. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's the, like the downside is that um, we got to, yeah. I mean, the upside is we got to live the dream, you know, have like the coolest job ever, like, you know, play all these a beautiful places around the world to different crowds at all these amazing festivals. The downside is there's not a lot of downtime to like enjoy those places. So that's, that's the sucky part, you know, like the I always think about, um, whenever I talk, like I always think about um, being in Byron Bay, mm. you know, getting to Australia, it's, it's so expensive. It's so time consuming. And we got to play, um, 
We got to play out there at an amazing festival, beautiful festival, get put up at this like luxury resort in Byron Bay in Australia. And um, it's Splendor. That was Splendor in the Grass. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it's but, another like, big festival. We were in our hotel yeah. room for like two hours, you know, so. Yeah. So the that's, yeah, that's the only, that's the only crappy thing. Cause like, so that's why when we went to Brazil and Julie didn't go because she was pregnant and it was, what was the virus that you Zika were trying to virus. The Zika virus. <laughs> so she didn't want to get oh. exposed to Zika virus when she was pregnant. So I went down there with uh, our friend Liv Marcico and she filled in, but I was like, I'm extending this trip because I don't know when I'm ever going to be in Brazil again. It's so hard to get a visa down there. And you know, it's a. It's like so expensive to get down there and everything. Um, and like, I am extending this trip. So her and I flew out after Sao Paulo. We flew out to uh, Rio and had a vacation. We stayed where Anthony Bourdain stayed when he made his um, episode down there in the exact same Airbnb. And um, which was an accident. I actually didn't know that at the time. I just Googled the neighborhood he was in. And then when we go, the, found the place that I liked. And then I found out that was the same spot later. But I had this amazing trip down there. But anyways, I digress. I wanted to talk about England for a minute because the I've always respected the English fans and critics more than the U.S. Oh. I have to say it. I don't care who agrees with me or not. They seem to know it and they get it and they got you guys. I mean, that seemed to pave the way for you guys. Did you have any ill feelings about the fact that you the U.S. was there, but it wasn't quite there the way England was for you? Uh, well, like I talk about the perfect storm of elements to, to launch something and make it successful. And I just think, um, this is sort of like a music business insider, uh, take on this, but the, the effort wasn't like well coordinated between North America and the UK. So like, I think the label over here had different ideas. They had this individualistic attitude about how they were going to do it. And I think they really needed to just follow the UK labels lead because mm. again, like the UK label had kind of more of an idea of, of how to launch it properly. I also, in turn, from a, from a business growth standpoint, you really want to scale in a smaller place, right? If you're scaling up. So like budgetarily and logistically scaling a band in the UK makes sense because you can be there for two weeks and you can hit every major market. You know what I mean? You can get so much done. You can like build a groundswell and then, and then from there, then you go over somewhere bigger, but you wait until you're kind of in a state, have a stable foundation before you start like bleeding out a lung, trying to make North America work. You know, touring over here is so hard. Everything is so far away. Um, it's just, it's so, it's so vastly different. Um, yeah, and like there were just stupid things, like the release dates were different. Yeah, I feel like what? that's really. Um, I don't know what the right expression is, but clipped our wings in a lot of ways. Um. It was very weird. Yeah. You guys really did a lot of touring, a lot of work between the first record and the second record. I mean, I remember, I think you toured with Wolf Mother, which is a great match for you guys, by the way. Peaches. Yeah. I mean, you guys did a lot of touring. And then you had the second record, Femagism. Did I say it right? Because I always worry that I never say it right. Royal yeah. Jelly, by the way, is one of my favorite songs period i love that song smile more also oh, i've been trying you. to get that there's a there's a seven inch single of smile more right oh he, i yeah, think there I, is i think it was on was it on one of those limited release things julie i don't know i i don't i don't know if there i don't think i have it if it's, remember that we, we were I on some it. of those <laughs> sort of like library release things it may have been that yeah you won it cool no, wow. I want it. Oh, you want oh. it. <laughs> I, wish I, I want it. it. Did Where you? Is it? What is it? You know, just one quick question about femagism. Did you like, how was it working with the guy from the Yeah, Yeah, Yeah? Is Nick Zinner? Nick Zinner? It was Nick a dream. Zinner. Yeah. A dream come true, you know. Were um, you a fan of theirs? 
huge. Uh, yeah. Huge. Yeah. Very influential on uh, on yeah. us. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it was honestly that was part of the reason that we walked away from our mm-hmm. first record label was because we knew that he was the guy and we we felt we were on the right path when we started working with him. But you know, they were really trying to ANR us and wanted us to try working with all these different, you know, big shot songwriter producers and do the whole major label thing, you know, and we were just we felt like this is it. Like we we get to make our this record with like one of our musical heroes. Like this is it. That's it's simple. So yeah. The the the, the first record to you know but almost it's, it's okay i'll say it it's a masterpiece and but the second record i really like wow, a lot thanks. i know I, I didn't have to really push that out that hard I, thank you wow um i'm gonna i'm gonna move along here because there's still so much i mean you toured with garbage blondie okay just one quick question about the the uh collaboration with flaming lips i just have to say that when i heard that cover of the pusher because I was a huge fan of that song, but your version of it is nothing like the the original version. And the video yeah. got me high yeah. just from watching it, you know? I mean, what was that experience like for you, working with the Flaming Lips? It's the best thing ever. Really? Life. Yeah, it was so fun. Yeah. It was so fun. It was, yeah, it was Wayne Disneyland, you know? It's Wayne Land. Wayne Land. Wayne Land. Wayne Land. <laughs> um, Wayne Land. Lips land. Yeah, it's pretty, it's pretty special. I actually just re-listened. I don't usually listen to my own music, our music, but I re-listened to that the other day because my daughter got a um my four-year-old, she got a pink CD player for Christmas and yes. some and she got some Disney Princess CDs. But John, my fiance, he pulled out he pulled that deep lip CD out for some reason. Just like Georgia, listen to this. This is mommy. <laughs> um and usually like usually she only wants to listen to her music like kids music but she was actually like into it and I was like wow she she actually likes it that's cool and that what I did what I realized listening to that record well how incredible it is how incredible underrated it is yeah absolutely how many f-bombs are on it I was like ooh. (laughs) did you did you actually you probably knew the song the pusher right did you know the song or did someone say let's cover this song well, we I didn't really know that it. song to be honest. I think I'd heard yeah, it, but I had I, I I wasn't like I didn't know much about it. I have to I have to be right brb Julie can brb yeah Julie you know the original version of that's like eight minutes long and you guys made a three minute song out of it that was pretty pretty yeah. incredible. Yeah. Did did Wayne basically kind of coordinate everything musically or was it more of a group effort? In terms of how uh, you Wayne really did. It. We went over there for like a week. Um, we stayed at his house, Oklahoma City. Yeah, and um, he has a studio there. I mean, yeah. that's where they do everything. And so we we were in with him and Stephen Draws, and we were kind of hashing out. We we wrote three songs at that time together, and then our time was up and you know we had been doing a lot of collaborations at the time and and when we reached out to Wayne it was in that that idea so we had made songs with you know KT Tunstall Peaches mm-hmm. with Soko with Jenny Lee from Warpaint with Jenny V from uh, Eagles of Death Metal with Aisha Hassan from Savages with Jamie Hintz from The Kills um so we had already been doing all these collabs and uh and so we reached out to Wayne as part of that so he's like yeah I'll just come we'll do some stuff and then basically he'd been working on those songs like mixing those songs that we'd worked on um with him and steven and he was like you know i think we should make a whole record (laughs) we were like okay yeah that sounds good um how long were you down there for we were down there for a week so the way we completed the the record was we we did it remotely and it was for the pandemic but it was just to get it done um so he he had he would like work up a lot of the music, send it to us. We would track vocals, but he really he had a very specific vision, and we were like happy to, you know, follow his lead. Um, and 
yeah. So then we had the whole record, but a lot of those songs were songs that were rejects from the Miley Cyrus record he did. Really? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. I didn't hear so, that. That's crazy. Yeah, he, now, you know, so like, wow. yeah. So, um, and he was just, I, I'm sure he came up with deep lips. Did Wayne, he... Wayne is the man with the plan. You know what I mean? Like he is a, a, a visionary without a doubt. Certainly and is. Across it, across every aspect of, of what you're doing. You know what I mean? Um, so yeah, he was incredibly inspiring. I mean, deep, crazy respect. Like for me, the soft bulletin is like in my top 10. You know, I spent easily 10,000 hours listening to the Soft Bulletin. It's a deeply meaningful, formative record for me as an artist, like without a doubt. So, yeah, that was truly. I didn't know how you guys were. I didn't know what you what what your reaction would be when I brought that up, because I don't you can never tell whether the artist really liked their their the record they made or not, you know, until afterwards. But it sounds like it was genuinely a good thing for you guys. Um, so good. It's so good. Yeah, I was listening to it. I was like, wow. It's... Um, I wanted to talk about Marriage for a few seconds because I thought that was a really good record too. The artsdesk.com wrote something really good. They wrote, the swagger is back, the volume is full whack, and they've broken free of the obvious creative constraints of only employing two instruments by bringing on board some of the cream of the musical sisterhood. I love that quote. Oh, never heard that. That's really not nice. either. It's what an English that? publication, uh, okay. theartsdesk.com. Well, I didn't read. Yeah, I didn't read reviews for this re for marriage because I, I was too traumatized. <laughs> I learned early on not to read reviews, um, even though like most of them are good. It's, you know, it's it's negativity bias, you know, that people have. So it's always like the the bad stuff that sticks with you. So I stopped doing that, but that's really cool. That's awesome. This is what happens when you make an absolutely brilliant first record. You always have to keep living up to what you've done in the past and stuff, you know? No, but even, even the reviews, there were reviews of the first record that were, you know, problematic. Really? I didn't read those. Yeah, I mean, we, <laughs> it, we were well-reviewed, but then it's like, for me, uh, music reviews should be done by people who appreciate and understand whatever it is you're doing. That's at least the starting point. So like we would have, there were a few reviews of Cistrionics of people who didn't like that genre. Why are they even reviewing it then? Like what can they exactly. possibly inform fan, potential fans of that music? That, that always like sticks in my craw when that kind of a thing happens. It's not just for me, for any artist. It's like you reading your review, I can tell that you don't even understand why this music is happening which you can you can understand why it's happening and you can and reviews are so dumb anyway by the way like you gotta do your research to music and decide for themselves I, i'm like, on your side here you know even though I've, I've been on both sides of the coin you got to do your research and you got to know what you're writing or you're talking about like i'm talking to you suppose i didn't know about any of this stuff i'd come across as an idiot you know i mean you shouldn't try and do something that you don't understand. I mean, if you don't yeah. make a record, why review it? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Cool. yeah. But I also feel like Deep Valley, we were both like, I don't know. We were both, what's the word? Yeah. Like either we should have come out in the seventies or we should have come out like in the nineties or nineties or like five or 10 years later. Like, I feel like we came out in a weird, like a weird time. I don't you know. You did. You did. I mean, that was a real dead time in the music business. You know, CDs were like dead, you know, and sales were hard to come by. Now we have this vinyl, you know, revival, you know, but mm -hmm. um, I first heard in September that you guys had made the decision to move on. And I had a, a lot, I, I had a feeling, and I, th I think I'm right that a lot of it had to do with motherhood and things like that. And I did read in, in an interview that you did, that you guys wanted to spend more time uh, with your children. Is that pretty much the re the main reason? It's a big part of it, you know? I mean, and also like Julie wanted to go back to school and I didn't really have the interest in keeping the band kind of, I don't know, keeping the band going without her. I don't know. It's kind of. 
it's just weird, like weird thing so it's just honestly i think at the end of the day it's a financial reality you know mm. it's like we didn't even like make the decision to break up we just this it wasn't working and it wasn't going to work so at least we're like well let's let's give it a good last hurrah instead of just it's like oh there's no deep valley anymore like whatever but but the reality of being moms and having two kids and touring like you need to be at a certain level to be able to make that work you know because at a certain point all of your child care expenses are just cannibalizing any money you make any little pittance of money you squeeze out you know unless you're at a certain level i mean it's like there's kind of it's like any other um, economy there's sort of no middle class here you know and I think one of you said in an interview that it's easier for guys to do. And it's true. It's true. Well, guys don't have to bring their kids with them. Right. You t- you show me any guy who took his baby on tour on a whole album cycle. Just show me one. Yeah. I want anyone to show me one. Can anybody show me one? The Killers. I'm Brandon open Flowers. To possible. Where Brandon, is- no, not Brandon Flowers. Yeah, Brandon Flowers from The Killers, right? Yeah, I'm just joking. his I don't wife know- go? Like, like my no, husband, I know. And I are... I'm, I'm half joking, but I'm pretty sure like they had their own tour bus for his family and all of his kids and his wife. So it's a totally different scenario because his wife is there for the childcare and probably a babysitter. But I think like, so my husband and I, so we, we, we have some touring coming up and my husband is touring at the same time. And when he told me that I'm like, oh, so you're going to take the kids with you. Right. <laughs> Cause like, I don't, how are we going to do this if we're both gone? Like you're going to take them with you. Right. And so it's like, it's it's preposterous because of course he was like, no, and that never even occurred to me. But meanwhile, if I'm touring, I have to either decide whether I'm taking them with me or, you know what I mean? It's just, it's so different. I don't know yeah. if there's a way to equalize it. There's There's such a deep feeling that at the end of the day, when push comes to shove, mommy is responsible, period. I get and it. Myself. Well, and it's as... like these years are so fleeting too, you know, like these young yeah. years and it's like, I don't know. It's, you kind of, it's, you need to be there for your kids and you want to make the most of it. Um, yeah. So I don't know. I mean, even it's not like super convenient for me that we're doing this tour when we are. Um, Cause like I still have an infant and I am going to like leave him behind for a couple of weeks, which is like sad, you know, but I just didn't really want, I just didn't think it was in my kid's best interest to take them along on this next thing. So they're going to be at home. I'm lucky. I have a granny nanny. Like my mom is so helpful. I'm so lucky. She's going to come so down. And, I mean, I don't have her all the time. I, she lives in North Northern California and I live in Southern California, but when I really need her, she'll come down and help. So I'm really fortunate that that's great. You know, Cause yeah. Cause my fiance, you know, is working super busy. Like we need childcare in a way. So just a couple of things and I'll let you guys go. Are you re-recording the first record? Did you already re-record the first, the whole record? We yeah. Did. Yeah. The release date is February 1st. This oh. show is coming out. Yeah. Is that it's coming so on good. a vinyl? Yep. Ooh. Yeah, you can you can pre-order vinyl. It's a double vinyl because it, oh. there's ten bonus tracks. So like mm. unreleased demos, um, and then Deep Valley's version of like B sides and rare tracks. Um, I can't believe how good it is. Like I'm just gonna say, like it was Julie's idea originally, and I was super annoyed, and I was like, I didn't want to <laughs> do it. I was I like, heard baby, oh, I can help. Like out it. of print. The records out of print. And yeah. we would, you know, and a lot of people ask for it. And we also like don't really make money from that because it was a major label deal. We don't really make money from those songs, even though they're like a lot of our most streamed songs. So it was either like license the record from Island or re record it. I was super annoyed by it at first. I didn't want to do it because I was just like, we had, you know, we had a big budget. We had a lot of time to do that first record. Like, it was so long ago. I'm like, I don't even know if my voice is that good anymore. Like, I don't know if we're going to have the same magic and energy, like how, like, I couldn't remember like all the thing, you know, all the overdubs and things I did on my guitar, like, but we, 
we did it raw and dirty. We did it quicker and we, you know, we kind of had a different approach this time, um, which was like, the the philosophy was not to like necessarily recreate the first record, but to kind of do the songs as they are now. So like how they have evolved over the years with all the all the li- like all the times we've played them live. You know they morph a little bit over the years, and we do a lot of those songs in different keys now. And um, you know. So that was, yeah, that was part of the approach was just not recreating it, but just kind of doing a sort of slightly different, just the version of it as it is now, I guess. And, and we also added, I played bass on all the songs. I saw um, that. Super fun and sounds so heavy and cool. And I was like, oh, okay, this is, this is why you need a bass player. (laughs) Because listening to the songs now, like with the bass, with me playing bass on them, like it adds such just a deep, dark bottom end that's like so Sabbath sometimes and just so dynamic and heavy and cool, you know? Um, I heard uh, Baby I Can Hell because it's up on, uh, on I, I think it was on YouTube or someplace. I heard it. It sounded fabulous, man. I was like, wow. Um so the last show that you're doing, I know you're going to be up here uh, in the Boston area in February, and I know you have about 10 other dates, but I I think I saw that Mexico City is the last show. Um, Yes. When is this airing? Uh, next Monday. Okay. What, are you giving me a scoop on something? Uh, no, I'm not going to give you a scoop. <laughs> I think there's going to we'll be a show. We'll just leave it at that, but yeah, for now... Mexico City. Um, I'm, I'm going to bet days. that there's going to be an LA show that you're not telling me about. Last well, there's an L- the LA show's on March 9th at the Telegram Ballroom. But I met another one at the end, you know, after, um, after Mexico there's City. Not, it's not, I mean, <laughs> the, a big announcement is coming, but it. But it, none of it's like confirmed yet or finalized. So even we don't really know. That's okay. I'm not going to pry. I believe you. But um, <laughs> but yeah, our last show might be in the country where we were. Where you blew up. Where we blew up. Yeah. But anyway, Wembley so, Stadium. Um... <laughs> Wembley. You heard it, folks. <laughs> Wembley Stadium. Zeppelin's yeah. getting back together to open for you guys. I heard. That's right. Next door to Wembley Stadium, there's a little <laughs> mini mart. We're gonna play in there. Um, but yeah, Mexico city, Mexico city. Hey, thank you. Greatest place on earth. Thank you guys so much for doing this. Yeah. I oh, really thank you appreciate for having it. us. I yeah, thank you for having us. You were, you were very uh, refreshing to speak to. I love your accent. And I'm hoping that I can, I, I make it to the crystal ballroom in uh, Somerville. You like my accent, really? It started as a Boston accent, but it ended up, I was in LA for 15 years. So that must be what happened. I don't know. Yeah. And well, it's, yeah. Um, Go ahead. Oh, never. It's okay. I have I have a couple questions, but we can, after we. Yeah, I'll, I'm going to get, I'll, I can stop it. But thank you so much. Yeah, thank Appreciate you so it. much, yeah, man. Thank you so much. Yeah, this was really, uh, really, really great. Really, you're. You're super uh, kind and cool and awesome and really appreciate well, it. Well, research. Yeah, well, all the nice things you said about our band. I never yeah, go in with you. high expectations for these things. I'm not going to lie. <laughs> wow. Thank you. But you're pretty awesome. Yeah.